Lectores de las Palabras Perdidas, Readers of the Lost Words. The Jesuit at the extreme right is reading a catechism. An Agustinian reads a Tagalog novena. A Recollect reads a Visayan prayer book. On the extreme left is a Franciscan reading a book written in Bicolano, the dialect of the territory that they controlled. During the Spanish period, catechisms were printed with a syllabus to teach natives how to pronounce words, but not to understand them. This is the Treaty of Tordesillas. The treaty that divided the world like an orange is the subject of this painting. The 15th century treaty was brokered by the Borgia Pope, Alexander VI. It established a line of demarcation that neatly divided ownership of the world and its inhabitants between Portugal and Spain. To the right of Alexander are the Catholic monarchs of Spain, Don Fernando of Aragon and Reina Isabella of Castile. And to his left is the Portuguese king, John II. The divided world is shown with Spanish and Portuguese angels and indigenous angels of the conquered territories armed with their native weapons, fighting over the lands divided by the Catholic Pope. Symbolos del poder, the symbols of power. This hocus painting is about the symbols of Spanish power. The quarters of the Spanish escudo show the more important churches in the Philippines, as well as the floor plan of a Spanish church. The Spanish shield superimposes Intramuros, the walled city, which was used by the Spaniards as their bailiwick during the colonial period. The churches of Panay, Zambales, Nueva Vizcaya, Cuyo, Misamis Occidental, Tugigarao, Isabela, Pauay, and Romblon also emblazon the schematics of Intramuros, emphasizing the control of the state in the propagation of the faith. Words from the law reserving a portion of the income of the state towards the building of the churches are quoted on the left corner of this painting. The Indio, who was caught between the powers of church and state, the twin powers that exercised control over his soul and daily existence, did not have a Chinaman's chance against the joint enterprise. La Marcha del Patronato, March of the Patronato. A mighty phalanx of angels, like Macedonian soldiers, descend upon these islands, waving banners bearing the names of conquered territories. Pampanga, Leyte, Nueva Cáceres or Naga, Nueva Castilla or Luzon, Samar, Paragua or Palawan, Cebu, Panay, Bool or Bohol, Iloilo, the sword and cross. The formidable union of state and church conquered these islands. This painter is Lorenzo Guerrero my great-grand-uncle in Father Blanco's garden. The Agustinian Fray Manuel Blanco created a botanical garden. He studied Tagalog and was so fascinated with local flora that he planted a garden inside the Agustinian convent of Intramuros. Although he conducted field research mainly in Batangas and Bulacan, he did visit other places. He made extensive documentation of local flora, which took him 12 years to finish. The first edition of this invaluable work 
flora de Filipinas según el sistema sexual de Lineo was printed by the University of Santo Tomas in During the Middle Ages, monastery scribes working in scriptoria oftentimes scraped off words written on animal parchment in order to use them again. The reused page is called a palimpsest. Sometimes words previously erased became visible again, revealing past secrets. In the Philippine palimpsest, the Dios te salve Maria is written over with a baginoong Maria. It's Tagalog equivalent, an overlay written with the blood of natives in the name of the Christianization. The Castilian origin of the prayer is revealed for all to see. The music of the Patronato. The elegant organist with a white wig is the Spanish Governor General, playing the bamboo organ of Las Piñas, completed by Friar Diego Serra, sometime in 1824. Aligned in the same row with the Governor General are members of the native Principalia. One level up are the Christianized coastal dwellers, the Tagalogs, Ilocanos, Visayans, Kapampangans, along with the Mohammedans and Sangleys, infidels who resisted Christianization. At the center is an Indio with a crossbow, determined to climb his way up to the crown which represents the King of Spain, patron of the Indies by virtue of the Patronato Real. Like Sisyphus, the Indios' attempt to climb the social-political ladder is condemned to never succeed. It is a hopeless task. To the right, a despondent Indio hangs himself. Near the finial of the bamboo organ, there are friars in distinct robes of their orders going about their merry business at the summit of power, yet never equal nor higher than the crown. That was the canticle of the Patronato Real. This is San Isidro Labrador, the patron of farmers, and this is San Roque, the patron of lepers. And this is the retablo del Rey Felipe II, the altarpiece of King Philip II. Felipe II, after whom the Philippines was named, is enshrined at the pinnacle of the ornate retablo. It may look blasphemous, but it attests to the true role of the Spanish crown in the Christianization of the natives of these islands. Beneath Don Felipe, in every single niche of the retablo, is dedicated to a saint mindfully selected to touch the hearts of the natives. San Isidro Labrador, the patron of agriculture, was introduced by the friars to make the new faith more attractive to the tillers of the soil. The Franciscans presented San Antonio de Padua as the saint who finds lost things for you. San Vicente Ferrer of the Dominican Order, who had the gift of tongues, was also the patron of builders. There were feminine saints, like Santa Magdalena, but this one is Santiago Matamoros. Another feminine saint is Oa Santa Monica, the mother of Saint Augustine. They were introduced by the friars in these shores. This is Saint Francis of Assisi. This is Saint Michael, killing a devil, and San Roque, patron of the lepers. Oh, 
She looks sad, this virgin in a corner of Cavite, la virgen en un rincón de Cavite. For three centuries, the miraculous image of the Nuestra Señora de la Soledad de Portavaga was enshrined in an obscure corner of what is now Cavite City. After a Spanish sentry found it in 1692 on the shores of Cañacao Bay, a small chapel was built for the Reina de Cavite, Luz de Filipinas, or simply Nuestra Señora de Portavaga. The image probably came from Mexico because the Manila Acapulco galleons always passed by Cavite. La Nuestra Señora de Soledad de Porta Vaga, now enshrined in the Church of San Roque, has always protected Cavite from devastating typhoons, terrible floods, and fires, as well as from treacherous pirate attacks. St. James, or Santiago, Santiago Matamoros, was the patron of the Spanish Empire. Here is Santiago de Matamoros is supposed to be St. James the Elder, an apostle of Jesus Christ. According to legend, he fought against the Moors in the Battle of Clavijo, which historians said never took place. Because of the Reconquista, St. James, or Santiago, was venerated as the patron saint of Spain until 1760 when the Pope declared the Immaculate Conception the patroness of the kingdom. Throughout the Spanish Empire, there were forts, towns, government buildings and churches dedicated to Santiago Matamoros. You can imagine how shocked the Spaniards must have felt when they encountered Moros in these far-flung islands they called the Philippines. Santiago Matamalayu, as we call him here, he is surrounded with vignettes depicting Christianization. A priest burning a native god and a friar holding up a manuscript written in Baybayin script. Indigenous communities in Palawan, Mindoro, and Bohol still use a native syllabary up to this day. Inadvertently, perhaps, Santiago was eventually indigenized. In religious colonial paintings, Spain's former patron is seen killing infidels who look more like indios of this archipelago, as illustrated in the Boxer Codex, than the Moors of southern Spain. <laughs> Lucifer has surrendered. What if Lucifer repents? What will happen to our world when evil is finally vanquished by its own volition? Who or what will fill the void? A crouched Lucifer abjectly receives the sacrament of confession after asking forgiveness for his sin of pride. Meanwhile, the serpent which had entwined itself around the monstrance containing the Holy Eucharist, is releasing its mortal grip. Can the world continue existing without the eternal battle between good and evil? Didn't God create all things material to test man's free will, which is also his creation? Darkness against light, evil versus good. Opposites must clash perpetually yet coexist at all times. Vanquish one, and the eternal dichotomy disappears. If evil no longer exists, can good be of any use? The faceless scribe writes that Lucifer has surrendered. We must now return to the void. <laughs> Thank you.
No me toques, corazón infame. Touch me not, impure heart. The members of the religious orders at the foot of the crucified Christ are shown on the left of the painting, and on the right is the tombstone of the Countess of Lizarriaga, which can still be found in the ancient Franciscan church of General Trias in Cavite. Below the picture is a panoramic painting of what Cavite used to look like during the Spanish period. On the top left are the poderes, powerful angels, carrying what looks like a treasure chest to the Spanish fort of Cavite. This painting is based on a story told by an old man who claimed to have been hired to enter a tunnel inside the fort of Felipe Neri, which connects to the old Franciscan church. La brisa de los fuertes, the breezes of the forts. Four friars from four religious orders, Agustinian, Franciscan, Jesuit, and Dominican, who, among others, came to Christianize the natives of these islands, are shown in this Hocus painting. Each friar menacingly holds a fan with a diagram of a military fort facing the viewer. From the left, Clockwise, the Agustinian brandishes a fan with the Fuerza de San Francisco, with four formidable bastions, an embankment, and impenetrable curtain wall. This was constructed in Nueva Segovia to watch over the northern provinces. The Dominican brandishes a fan with the schematics of another fort built within his ecclesiastical domain. The Jesuit shows the Fuerza de la Virgen del Pilar in Mindanao, while the Franciscan displays the Fuerza de San Felipe in Cavite, garden of the entrance to Manila Bay. This painting shows that the church represented by the friars and the state depicted by the forts were one and indivisible, as stipulated by the Patronato Real. El hombre olvidado, the forgotten man. In those days, extensive land donations were obtained by crafty friars with deathbed manners in exchange for holy masses celebrated in perpetuity that would guarantee a higher place in heaven for the generous donor. The dying man in this hocus painting, obviously a former conquistador, as shown by a Morion helmet under his bed, was the owner of the Hacienda de Orion in Bataan. In 1678, on his deathbed, he bequeathed all of 2,000 hectares of his royal land grant to the Dominican order in exchange for a safe and speedy passage to heaven. With his last breath, the moribund former conquistador implores the Dominican friars, Todo en el nombre de Dios, les regalo dos mil hectáreas en cambio de oraciones perpetuas para mi pobre alma. All in the name of God, I give you two thousand hectares in exchange for perpetual prayers for my poor soul. As a friar administers the sacrament of extreme unction, a scribe dutifully records the man's last will and testament. Keeping watch is a mysterious figure wearing a capirote, the conical hat worn by the penitents of Sevilla during Holy Week. Evil permeates this death scene. A seven-headed devil appears representing the seven deadly sins. In the corner of the room, the India servant of the conquistador curses the master who may have wronged her. Sumama ka na sa kanila. Go to hell with them. Her words 
are written in ancient Tagalog script, obviously alluding to the seven-headed demons. The Celestial Chess Players Two celestial chess players are deeply engaged in their game, while angels bearing a mirror reflect the crucial position of the pieces on the chessboard. The angel on the left wears a sash that says, Capitania General de las Islas Filipinas, which was how this colony was called. The sash of the other angel reads, Espejo de los Ángeles which means mirror of the angels, implying that it reflects only what is true. Notice the position of the pieces. The black ones represent the Indio. The black king's position is severely restricted by the two bishops occupying their posts. The bishops represent ecclesiastical authority. The rooks are threatening the two helpless black center pawns. The rooks symbolize state power. There are more black pieces, but the fearsome white pieces are threatening Mate at every turn. The fact is, the black pieces are powerless, like the Indios during the Spanish colonial period, who could never have won this hocus chest match, simply because the white king, which should be on the chessboard, is absent. The Way of the Cross in Manila, El Camino de la Cruz in Manila. Inspired by historian Rey Ileto's monumental book, Passion and Revolution, this hocus painting attempts to show how the Filipino masses translated the passion and death of Jesus Christ into their own existence, struggle, and redemption during Spanish colonial times. Jesus Christ suffered at the hands of his fellow Jews, who scourged him mercilessly, dragged him to Calvary, where he was crucified on the cross between two thieves. In the Philippine colonial scene, according to Dr. Ileto, the Passion made available a language for venting ill feelings against oppressive friars, principalia, and agents of the state. To the Christianized masses during the colonial times, the scenes of oppression shown in this painting were quite familiar. They identified life in this valley of tears with the passion of Christ, his death and glorious resurrection. That is why the Filipino masses seem to be long-suffering, docile, and submissive in the face of injustice and oppression. The Savior will come someday and take them with Him to paradise. Libro de Almas Books of the Soul the historic church of San Jerónimo in Morong, built by the Franciscans in the 17th century, represents the gateway to heaven in this hocus painting. Filipino natives are seen milling around the esplanade of this imposing church. The ecclesiastical symbols of major religious orders are emblazoned on its portals, each represented by a friar seated in front preoccupied with a census dramatically called the Libro de Almas, Book of Souls, containing the names of enrolled souls. Attached to the church is the convent where souls await final judgment. There are patron saints standing by its arches, ready to intercede for the faithful Indios. There are only four possible destinations, Limbo, purgatory, the fires of hell, and paradise in heaven. Angels direct the souls to their final destination. Only those who are led to the belfry are flown directly to the Almighty. Oh, 
Narciso Claveria Isaldua, Governor General and Captain General of the Philippines from 1844 to 1849, issued the Catalogo Alfabetico de Apellidos. This self styled Conde de Manila believed that for reasons of administrative and fiscal expediency, all the natives of this archipelago should have proper surnames. He issued a superior decree in November 1849, ordering the natives to adopt names from the catalogo. There were well-defined exceptions to his command. Descendants of the native royalty may voluntarily change their names. Most of the surnames were in Spanish or sounded like Spanish, which have led many Filipinos to believe that they descended from Spaniards. Maliciously, surnames were made out of words pertaining to human ordure or words depicting vices, ailments, deformities, embarrassing surnames, which would not have been chosen by those who knew Spanish. To compel natives to obey, local government officials as well as parish priests were instructed not to issue any permits or official documents to natives not exempted from the decree, whose surnames did not appear in the catalogo. Those who reverted to their old names after having registered the new ones were penalized with a jail term. is a tableau of Filipinos from the fragmented archipelago of Las Islas Filipinas, the islands referred to as the Empire of the Friars. These are the people whom Jose Rizal loved and whom the friars subjugated in God's name. At the center of the painting is an Indio doing guard duty for the Spanish crown. Or was he thinking of how to overthrow his Iberian masters? The noted historian, Dr. Milagros Guerrero, said that if you will read the first chapter of Rizal's El Filibusterismo, you will realize the reason why the friars willed Rizal's death. It was because Rizal's genius awakened his people from centuries of slumber caused by religion. El Capitan Chino, the Chinese Capitan. At first glance, the Chinese in the Philippine colony had all the trappings of Christianized natives. Studiously, they read the Shilu or the Doctrina Cristiana, printed in the Chinese language by Kengyo of Binondo. They venerated the Mother of God in La Nuestra Señora del Pronto Socorro, Ang Virgen ng Biglang Awa. In this hocus painting, the Capitan Chino is shown inside his luxurious home, seated by a window with a view of an elaborate arch 
inspired by a 1797 illustration of the Parian. Clothed in the finest silk, the captain wears a breastplate with a hand-painted stylized design of the bagua or octagonal shaped alcaiceria, the fabled silk market of the Parian, the source of his wealth and influence. A blue and white jar, probably a souvenir of a festive event as it is decorated with a pagoda-like tower that was erected at the foot of the Puente Grande in Binondo to honor King Ferdinand VII is found beside the Capitan. There is a copy of the first catechism in Chinese, Doctrina Cristiana, but it is on the floor which hints that the Capitan must have thrown it in disgust because he was secretly still a heathen at heart. There is a telltale opium pipe beside the bowl with a map of Amoy, his hometown in China. Dios está esperando. God is waiting. The Indios suffering on earth are rewarded by eternal life. Eternal life doing what the doctrine adequately fails to explain. Perhaps he will be rewarded the right to play music for the Heavenly Father as the angels above seem to suggest. The right to pass the gates of heaven are controlled by the holy orders. Although the fences seem inutile and locked gates useless, since the Indio could easily surmount the brick fences and cross the checkered board of night and days towards the stairs leading to heaven. But who is the Indio to question established dogma? of our past. When the Church, in conjunction with the Spanish civil authorities, ruled the lives of the Indios. El Papa depicts Bishop Cesar Maria Guerrero, the Sabio y Santo of Philippine Church history. This card shows the Bishop with the Filipinos that he so loved standing in front of him. Behind him is a constantly uprooting tree which tested his powers as an exorcist of the church. To his right is the ecclesiastical coat of arms of Archbishop Odoherty minus the hat and tassel. It is turned upside down to symbolize the existence of an unpaid debt. La Justicia. A native woman is seen in front of a church, the lost church of Oton, which was dedicated to the Immaculate Conception and located in the ancient eponymous town of Iloilo province. In 1948, an earthquake destroyed the Church of Oton. The painting shows a woman balancing two earthen plates. She symbolizes justice. El Mundo, the world. The card shows the Carriedo Fountain. It shows the Indios occupying the lowest tier of the fountain. The members of the religious orders occupy the second tier, and the coat of arms of Spain, the symbol of the Patronato Real, occupies the highest tier of the fountain after the crucified Christ. El Colgado, the Hanged Man. The Hanged Man is the most enigmatic card in the tarot pack. Some say that he is the symbol of injustice, as in the case of the Gombursa priests 
sacrificed on the altar of ecclesiastical power. In the tarot card, the man is hanged upside down in the watchtower of Punta Cruz in Maribojoc, Bohol, which was built by the Recollect priests in 1796 to serve as a sentinel that would warn against attacking Moro pirates. El Juicio, the Judgment This image depicts the Last Judgment, the Spanish Juicio Final. The carta shows the natives on the way to final judgment at the magnificent cemetery of San Joaquin in Iloilo. One can count 20 steps to the marvelous capilla. According to local legend, these steps were made by the women of the town. The capilla is where the final rites are conducted before the dead are laid to their final resting place and their souls sent to whatever awaits them in the afterlife. El Mago, the magician. The card shows a friar intoning his incantations like a magician. He uses a scapular, a blank book empty of words and letters, and a broken rosary, symbolizing that he has debased the faith. We can still feel the result of El Mago's labors as evidenced by the unbridgeable disconnect between the fanatical piety we show during religious ceremonies and our lack of Christian values in daily life. I am happy to present to you the Cartas Filipinensis, the only playable tarot cards with a Philippine theme. La última carta, the last card. Una Iglesia Antigua en Basei Sama, an old church in Basei Samar. In Basei Samar, there is a church on a hilltop dedicated to Saint Michael, head of the host of archangels that guard the gates of heaven. The church was built in the 18th century with an inscription carved on its pediment which gloriously proclaims, Hac es Domus Dei. A porta celli. This is the house of God and door to heaven. Was this taken literally in those days? The mirror image of the church is upside down and the two images are attached at the apex 
creating an hourglass effect. Entry into the church through the inscribed portal enables one to enter a parallel universe where angels and heavenly winged creatures live in a parallel existence. The Spanish Dirge You can almost hear the dirge being played by these two Indios to signal the end of the Spanish Empire where the sun reputedly never set. The Philippines was the haughty empire's crepuscule. In this painting, angels from heaven herald the inevitable and irreversible end of the Spanish Empire to the tune of the Indo dirge. The winged messengers of the Almighty descend upon our archipelago, the last jewel of the crown, to take away its remaining symbols. The Spanish colors, yellow, gold, and blood red. The Spanish letter Ñ, which is peculiar to the Spanish language. Other angels are fleeing with the bishop's mitre, a Spanish sword, and the key to heaven which, according to the friars, must be Spanish. An angel bears the esfera, or orb, symbol of the world once dominated by the empire. Another carries a treasure chest containing the wealth extracted from the colony. A fitting background to the Indian musicians is the Church of Cuyo, the most peculiar of all churches because it physically embodies the union of church and state. El Puente del Capricho, the Bridge of Capriz. In the remote but enchanting town of Mahaihai Laguna, there is an unfinished 19th century stone bridge called Tulay Napigi, so called because the Franciscan friar who ordered its construction would cane the Indios on their pigi or buttocks for not working fast enough. The bridge was never finished, either for lack of funds or maybe because of the turf war it provoked between the Dominican and Franciscan orders. This hocus painting dramatizes that internecine conflict. On the left, the Dominicans feverishly clamber up the bridge to engage the Franciscans head-on. Both orders are seen brandishing the religious symbols and images of their orders, as if these were weapons of war. Meanwhile, on the river below, Jose Rizal, riddled with bullets, his novel stuck under his arm, escapes with a boatman on a banca, decorated with a frieze that he had sketched on the Nolly's cover. The scene is replete with details associated with Laguna's heroic son. A Draco Risalis, the winged lizard of the Pitan, creeps up the bridge. A disheveled Sibila Kumana frantically waves a warning at the two fugitives. A deceitful monkey argues with a guileful turtle. At the bottom right, a dog desperately attacks a crocodile to avenge the death of her pup. Rizal's ang paghihiganti ng isang ina, revenge of a mother. An India water carrier is seen at the far left. She is torn between following the Dominicans up the bridge or Rizal in his fight for freedom. It's a nightmare, La Pesadilla. This hocus triptych depicts good and evil locked in a fierce and perpetual battle for hegemony over the earth and its creatures. Take your time to unravel each image, nightmares in one's mind. These are the days without God, mga araw na walang Dios, post Golgotha and pre-resurrection. There were demonic times in the country's history during which Filipinos feared that there was no God. There is a man wearing a dunce cap, seated by a whirlpool beside a clock whose numbers are reversed 
trivializing the letters historia, history, mindlessly obscuring the past, a hindrance to preparing for the future. An old woman hurls a crucifix as if it were a grenade at the direction of death, marching in a phalanx. Beside the meandering river, an ancient symbol of life, a monstrous capre, plays mournful dirges on the bamboo organ, a fitting background to the thunderous clash between the forces of evil and the army of good. Shrieking wildly, a demented friar commits sacrilege by riding on a dragonfly, which is the symbol of the crucified Christ. He rides on the popularity of the crucified Son of Man. Another man, wearing the clothes of a member of the Principalia, rides a creature that looks like a queen termite with wings. A little girl crouches in fear in the middle of the painting. The living is seen carrying death standing on top of an open palanquin, a skeleton beating a drum with a symbol of the Christian Inquisition. Rat-like lemmings are seen running towards the river in an act of collective self-destruction. Ah, there is a glimmer of hope as an innocent child holding a candle walks towards the Christless cross. To the right, a lady sits before a mirror, grooming herself, oblivious of everything. The Philippine Atlantis, the lost island of San Juan. Where was this lost island and why was it called San Juan? This hocus painting is an attempt to revive interest in the island. Did it slip back into the sea after an earthquake? Did its inhabitants look like those shown in the 18th century British prints? Why was it named in honor of St. John? A cartographic line runs from the Dove, the Holy Spirit, to an island in the east and to the southwest intersecting a bamboo bar scale bearing a series of numbers. In front of the bamboo bar is a mysterious friar with a tail holding a protractor which may serve as a scale to measure the distance of San Juan to the nearest island on the map. The measured distance in the painting is not in accord with Dampierre's description of the location of the island since the panel was intended to be the subject of a fictional short story. The church at the lower left is imaginary while the cherubs on the right represent the four winds. The letter combinations are mysterious inscriptions inscribed on a wall of the Fort of Cebu and mentioned by Henry Savage Landor in his 1904 book, Gems of the East. A volcano, a monk with a tail, an old church, chart lines, the compass rose, gives a fictionalized explanation on why the island disappeared and adds another legend to the Philippine Atlantis. Kasama natin ngayon ang curator, guest curator na exhibit na Hocus, si Miss Gemma Cruz Araneta. <laughs> Ma'am, how do you feel na parang may homecoming kayo? You were the former director of the National Museum. Tama yan, tama yan, uh, Xiao. Baka hmm. hindi ka pa naipanganak noon. Hindi pa nga ako <laughs> uh, idea ng mga parents ko. <laughs> so parang ang uh, homecoming ko ito. Dahil nung nakita ko itong Hocus Collection, pinakita sa akin ni Attorney Sol at saka ni Guy Custodio, mm -hmm. naisip ko, ang ganda nito ng mga paintings na ito mm -hmm. tungkol sa ating kasaysayan. Yes. Diba? Dapat makita ito ng lahat ng mga Pilipino. At naisip ko, dapat sa isang lugar na katulad ng National Museum. 
Kasi in a way, uh, kung yung dapat laman din sa National Museum ay actually dapat mga bagay na hindi lamang for self-expression. Oh, kundi yung nagpapakita ng kwento natin. Oo, oh, ng ating kasaysayan. Yes. Diba? At ito, makikita mo yung napakaguluhang uh, kaugnayan ng sining, ng pintura sa ating kasaysayan. Oo, oh, kasi parang in a way, art reflects history. Mm. And uh, uh, history is reflected through art. Oo, at sabi nga ni Attorney Sol, itong bawat isang kwadrong ito ay parang isang kabanata ng ating kasaysayan. Mm. Kaya malalim. Malalim ang mga sinasabi dito sa kwadrong ito. At ako naman ay natutuwa na yung uh, intellectual author at saka yung pintor ay parang nagkaisa sila dito. Diba? Kasi siyempre, alam mo na naman, may mga pintor na ayaw nila na tuturuan mo sila. Diba? At oh. meron namang mga abogado, mga istoryador, ayaw nilang hmm, may, may kaugnayan sa, sa mga pintor, sa sining. Oh, parang nahihiya diba? sila na oh, kababawan oh. nito, dapat oh, oh. mataas, oh, intelektual. Oo, oh, yun na nga. Oh. So, dito sa, sa exhibit na ito, naipakita na malalim ang kasaysayan. Pwede rin malalim ang si ang sining at ang pintura. So in a way parang popularization of history. Oo. Pero ginagawa ito na inaakay mo sa pagpapalalim pa yung mga manonood. Oo. Hindi nga ba sabi nila, a picture is worth a thousand words. Oh, ay, very true with Hopkins. Oo, very true. So titingnan mo yung isang kwadro, makikita mo lahat ng mga simbolo doon at siyempre magtataka ka. Ano kaya ang ibig sabihin nito? At doon ma magkakaroon ng interest yung mga tao Oo. to do their research, exactly. to read books. Kahanapin diba? nila ngayon kung anong ibig sabihin. At makikita nila na may kaugnayan yan sa kanilang buhay. Wow! How was the experience of doing this again? No? Na nagkakaroon na rin, nag, nag, uh, museum ulit kayo. Oo nga eh. Ako'y natutuwa. Sa, sa totoo lang, meron nga nagtanong sa akin dyan sa labas, dito na ba kayo uli nagtatrabaho? <laughs> <laughs> sana nga, no? sana magkaroon pa ng isa pang hocus uh, exhibition. Oh, yung hocus pocus na yun. <laughs> But anyway, ma'am, uh, bakit maraming salamat, Shao, uh -huh. na ikaw naman ang nagpaliwanag nitong mga pintura. Nako, wala akong ano man yan, bilang guho. Eh, kailangan dalhin ng mga guho yung mga estudyante nila dito. Kasi parang, eh, alam mo, hindi ko sila nakikita bilang classical paintings. They're actually surreal, avant-garde. Uh, iba, it takes you to a higher level. Oh, pero sa biglang tingin, aakalain mo na, ah, antique painting yata ito. A new antique pala. Diba? Tapos yeah. lapit ka, eh, lumang kaho yung ginamit. Iisipin mo, luma nga ba ito? Ngunit bakit parang iba yung sinasabi? Kore. Diba? Now, I, I want to ask you, bakit ba hokus itong Ano? Ah, kasi nga, eh, kombinasyon niya ng pangalan nitong dalawang autor, hmm. si Ophelenia, H.O., at saka Custodio. Ah. Guy Custodio, kaya Hocus. Hocus. Di ba bagay na bagay? Ano? Oh, bagay na bagay uh -oh. din, kasi parang in a way, um, yung mga paintings na ito, parang magic eh. Parang magic magic. Uh, realism, magic surrealism, whatever yes. you call uh -oh. it. No? Uh -oh. But it, 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 it tells us of our past, Uh, despite the fact that the images are new, mm -hmm. and despite the fact that uh, this is actually a hodgepodge of symbols, mm -hmm. that uh, mm -hmm. when you conjure it, may meaning talaga. Oo, talaga. Maintindihan mo yung sinasabi. Now, to end, uh, ang tanong ko lang, um, as a nation, uh, kasi di ba heritage pa mana, o bilang mana mm -hmm. na mahalagang bagay o kayamanan, mm -hmm. how should we treat Uh, our heritage, our artists, as a people, as a nation, ano yung kahalagahan nila sa atin? Eh, dapat nga, dakilain natin ang ating mga artista, lalo na yung mga national artists, yung mga yeah. nilikha. No? Right. At saka, yung pamana sa atin ng nakaraan, hmm. eh, dapat, uh, bigyan natin ng respeto at huwag naman natin sira-sirain. Oh. ba? Diba? Itago natin, alagaan natin para sa salinglahing Pilipino. Maraming po salamat. Salamat rin sa iyo, Shao.